Hello, today is April the 15th, 2022. My name is Ileana Rodriguez. I'm interviewing Susan Zamora for the University Library Special Collections and Archives at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, hereby abbreviated as the TRGV. This project is in partnership with the Voices Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Please know, Miss Zamora, that this interview will be placed in the University Library Special Collections and Archives at UTRGV and shared with the Voices Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. If there is anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there is something you want to talk about, please bring it up and we'll talk about it. The University Library Special Collections and Archives will archive your interview along with any other photographs and other documentation you were willing to share. UTRGV University Library will retain copyright or non-exclusive right to the interview and any other materials you donate to special collections and archives at UTRGV. Because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need to record you consenting to make sure you agree with our interview process procedures before we continue. So I'll ask you a series of six questions. Please say, yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree after each question. Do you give University Library Special Collections and Archives at UTRGV consent to archive your interview and your materials at the UTRGV University Library? Yes, I agree. Do you grant UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives right, title, and interest in copyright over the interview and any materials you provide? Yes, I agree. Do you agree to allow UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes, I agree. <laughs> Do you grant the University Library Special Collections and Archives consent to share your Zoom inter interview with the Voices Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin? For yes, I agree. Oh. For inclusion in the Voices of Pandemic Oral History mini project, which will include posting this interview on the internet. Yes, I agree. As you recall, we previously filled out a pre-interview form. We use information from the pre-interview form to help in research. To enter form, the entire form is kept in secure Voices server at the University of Texas at Austin. Before Voices sends it to UTRGV interview library special collections and archives, we would have stripped out any contact information for yourself or family members so that will not be a part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at UTRGB University Library. The final two questions ask for your consent on what I just described. Do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview in your public file available to researchers at UTRGB University Library Special Collections and Archives? Yes, I agree. On occasion, UTRGB Special Collections and Archives and Voices receive requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you agree consent for us to share your phone numbers or your email with journalists? Yes, I agree. No? You can say yes or no. Yeah, yes, I agree. Thank you for your consent. Uh, your experiences and interviews mean a lot to us at UTRGV Special Collections and Archives. I look forward to what you say in the interview questions I will now ask. That was the voices of the pandemic preamble. I will now mm -hmm. start the question. Susan Samora, thank you for your time. Like we had previously discussed before, your stories and experiences are valuable to us at UTRGV Special Collections and Archives and to our partners at the Voices Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Because you have been a university student during the COVID-19 outbreak, who has also been an advisor to fellow students, work, as a nurse tech and as the oldest child of both your parents' households, you've been a great help in taking care of your younger siblings while your mother takes care of your ill grandmother. I know you have a meaningful stories and experiences to share on how COVID has impacted these key aspects of your life. So before we talk about COVID, uh, can you please share with us a little bit about yourself uh, who you are, how you wish to be known, who is Susan Zamora? Um, I wasn't prepared for that question, but 
I guess my name is Susan Zamora. Um, I am a nursing major at UTRGV and I graduate this May, 2022. Um, I got into the nursing program. I started in the fall of 2020. So right after COVID had just hit. Um, I have worked as a peer advisor since the summer of 2020 at UTRGV. So it's been almost two years now. And I've also worked as a nurse tech for the past couple months. I can't think of the exact date. Um, I am the oldest of both my parents' households. In fact, my youngest sibling and I are like 16 years and 11 months apart. I always say 17, 17 years apart. Um, I don't know what else I could say about me in particular. Well, I have more questions to help you guide guide you on specific points that I want to talk about. Okay. Um, but uh, lastly, just mention uh, how old are you? Right. Um, I'm 22. I turned 22 in February. So, yes, I just turned 22 like two months ago. Okay. Um, this first section of questions asks to please share your stories and memories from when the COVID-19 pandemic made its first impact in December 2019 to about the summer of 2020. So the first question I wanna ask you is, can you share some memorable stories about how you first heard or learned about COVID? So radio, TV, children, social media, like. Okay. Um, so like December, 2019, when COVID was hitting um, in like China, I actually talked about it a lot and we were concerned about it because my boyfriend's family is Taiwanese and so they watch their news in Mandarin. And so that was being really covered over there, um, both in Taiwan and in China. And so um, we would talk about it a lot. It was kind of this new thing. They're like, we don't know that it was a new virus. And then they started shutting down. We're like, oh gosh, hopefully it doesn't come over here. Halfway across the world, how could it get, it got here? <laughs> Um, but I think from all that time, the thing I remember most clearly is that it was spring break. I was literally in spring break and I had gone up to Austin, um, with, with, uh, because my boyfriend goes to school in Austin, UT Austin. So I was up there for my spring break. Um, I think we had a different spring break. I can't remember. And they said like, you know, it's in Texas, it was in California, and then it was in Texas, and then it was in wherever, and they're like, okay, like, we're gonna extend it, and I was like, okay, we're like, uh, where is it, like, since it was Austin, it's one of the bigger cities in Texas, and we were kind of like, okay, when's it gonna get here, mm -hmm. and what's that gonna mean, and I remember we were planning to come back home down to the valley anyway so we drive home and we stop to eat like at this like sushi restaurant it was really good and that was the last time that I ate in a restaurant I can't remember since I've eaten in a restaurant since then March 2020 oh my God. um I know and I love restaurants but I have not eaten one because of that and I remember we got home to the valley and his parents were here and mine, we're all here. And it was crazy because I think that day or the next day, like there was already a case in Austin. And we're like, what if we were walking around next? <laughs> we're all freaked out. And then it took like a week uh, until they had a confirmed case in the Valley, I think. Mm -hmm. But that's what I remember most clearly is that we were coming back down and then it was already there. We're like, and there was, it was, the information coming out wasn't as um, clear as it is now. So like at the time during the spring break, when uh, schools were extending their spring break vacations, like what was the most like um, absurd rumors or early reports that you heard that, uh, that you can remember from back then, like hearing? I guess, I mean, I heard a lot because 
two of my parents are teachers and they work mm. at high schools. Yeah. So it was crazy with them too. You know, they extended it, extended it, extended it. And they're like, okay, we got to get them back in school. What do we do? Let's try and put them online. Uh, but I think the most like absurd and crazy rumors were that they were just going to cancel the rest of the school year. Mm. To be honest, they almost did. I don't think that the kids went back. Like the kids went back until like mid-April. It was almost over anyway, mm-hmm. like in terms of school year. Um, some rumors that seemed like they make sense now and they made sense then. It was just kind of crazy to think about. It's like, okay, this next year school is going to be online. And the, the RGV is like very low income. Mm-hmm. So to me, it was like, how are we going to get everyone online? Like not everyone has access to computers. A lot of low income families, well, a lot of families have more than one kid, right? And since most of us are low income in the Valley, it's like, okay, how are you going to have like five laptops for all five kids for to be in class at a time? Yeah. And so the district really had to invest money a funny, not funny story is that they were putting, the city of Donna was like putting up these Wi-Fi towers mm. so that kids could use those that Wi-Fi from home and be online in school. And they like never worked. Like they, they kept actually, saying, they, oh, it'll they, work, it'll work, it'll work. And it never worked. And then it would work a little bit and it didn't work. Mm. I didn't know that. That's cool. I actually didn't know that. Yeah. And like the kids at the high school are like, it doesn't even work. Like, it goes on and off. I can't finish anything. Mm. Um, I know a lot of elementary students got iPads. I know the older kids got, like, Chromebooks. And then it just, it was whole other issues. Like, kids not knowing how to use it. Um, parents borrowing it. Just things like that. Um like I yeah, I mean I guess the most absurd rumor in general was that we would be online and then we were online. Yeah. I mean at that point it seemed crazy to think about. Yeah, at that point yeah. it was like, what? How could yeah. you possibly do that? Like yeah. So it, it kind of ties into uh, what we were talking about, but at what point did you realize that the pandemic was a serious life altering event? Um mm. I knew the pandemic was serious when I realized, when I saw the lockdowns in China, like the actual like lockdowns, I thought, okay, like this is serious, but they're also a little more strict over there. Then when I came over here, I remember like after the first like death, everyone was kind of like, whoa, why is it killing us? Isn't it just like a virus? Like, isn't it like the the flu? Um... And it, it wasn't, it was more severe. And so I know in healthcare, people were really freaked out about the virus because everything that we knew about like respiratory infections didn't apply. When you sit someone up, it's supposed to help them breathe, right? Mm-hmm. Cause their lungs have more room to expand there. It's easier. And a lot of patients with COVID could not breathe like that. You had to like put them face down. you don't do that for for most things. So it was very like, what are we dealing with in terms of that? Um, But I think the moment that I thought it was super serious is when they really did um, like very serious. It's just when everyone started, when the shutdowns happened, Mm To me, I was like, okay, we're shutting down. That's really serious. That never happened to me in my yeah. lifetime. I don't think it's ever happened in my parents' lifetime or even my grandparents' lifetime. So I was, I would not have been as freaked out as I was if things had been more stable. But like grocery stores were empty. Um, getting the necessities was harder. 
you had to like stand outside H-E-B in the morning if you wanted toilet paper at all like it was there but there was so few and everyone wanted so many um it was it was it was different I'm remembering back it was different back then it was crazy and uh, going off that do you remember what it was like for you during the stay-at-home orders in 2020 like do you have any stories from this time that you could tell this is not a serious story it's a funny story but um during that time I think it was like the very ending of school so it was like May and I think we had a curfew still like oh you should yeah we still had like a curfew it was like between April it was in May it was like in April to May because I finished school online I remember but my boyfriend's family was like, look, like we can't have you guys going back and forth because it's dangerous. You can get COVID. We don't know. We're like, okay. Okay. So I just decided to go live over there. I think it was like four weeks total because I was taking Chinese too and I needed help with my Chinese homework. And it's gonna sound weird if they ever see it, but. <laughs> They did help me though. I needed I needed in person instruction for that, and I was like, "It'll be nice. It's fine. Like, it's fine." The funny story, the funny part of that story at the end is that we were cooking, and his parents um, are like from Argentina, and so they were very very cautious about everything in terms of like the shortages and stuff. And they would, they're they're also like healthier people than I am personally. And so we were cooking. I remember his sister was down here with her boyfriend too. So we're all in the same house together and they would cook and I would eat the food. I liked it. They would cook like cabbage and carrots and rice and like chicken and stuff like that. It was really good. It was really good. But I was losing weight and I lost like 10 pounds and the his mom and his sister like came up to me like privately and they're like if you don't like the food like we can make something else and I was like what are you talking about like I'm eating that (laughs) (laughs) it's good and they're like you you're losing like so much weight like you look like you look sick like are you okay and I was like and I laughed I I couldn't help it I felt so bad I laughed in their face I was like "Ah!" and they're like why are you laughing (laughs) and I was like it's because I haven't had a Cheeto in four weeks (laughs) my body is dying (laughs) they were just feeding me so healthy and I was losing weight and and they're like well what's happening I just wasn't eating shit and it was really bad they didn't have sweets in the house not necessarily by choice like a lot of stuff was just sold out Mm -hmm. And because it was six of us in the house, like I felt bad eating like snacks in between meals. And so, and like the dad, he loves Cheetos. And so he would eat his bag of Cheetos. That's like his snack. That's his snack. So I wouldn't eat it. I was scared. And I remember like, it sounds so sick, but it was like the middle of the night. (laughs) and I would wake up and I was like I need sugar (laughs) and I would go and I would take the marshmallows out of the cereal (laughs) and I would eat it because I was done I couldn't but in general like it was good food I just I was like look I'm not used to that like usually I eat chips and I eat cookies and these are my Mm -hmm. snacks and instead I've been eating like grapes and rice and cabbage with chicken that, that's the reason it's good food I'm just not used to it that's I don't know I think that's just a funny story from the lockdown it's not a serious story but it is funny to me oh, it's funny it's funny yeah I, I, I just thought it was so funny I, I don't know <laughs> um so over the last couple of years what news media social media or other sources uh do you rely on to keep you informed about COVID why do you prefer prefer these uh, new sources. Can you repeat the question, please? So, um, over the last couple of years, what news media, social media, or other sources do you rely on to keep you informed about COVID? Why do you prefer these news sources? This is going to sound really bad because I don't keep super 
I do keep informed, but um so if you if you don't, then where do you get your sort where do you get your COVID information from then? So I get it on Twitter. That sounds bad. But I follow major news outlets on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And so then they have these stories. I also yeah. follow like KRGV, New Channel 5 oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. on Twitter. And I'm always like liking their like weather reports, everything. Um so I do I usually just get it from there just because it's easier to just pop up. Um and the bigger stories are more at the forefront. At my house, so at my house, back when I was in high school and I would have to wake up really early, I would turn on like the TV and I would just watch the news in the morning because I was a nerd. And I had nothing else to do. It was either that or watching like, what is it, Bakugan? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so I would switch between those deciding what to watch in the morning. Um, here... Where I live right now, we don't usually watch the news, but during COVID times, during like elections and stuff, we always like have the news like running. And so we would watch um, News Channel 5, CNN, ABC. We would watch all these news networks. Um, so I would get a lot of the COVID news like during COVID from there. In terms of like now just keeping up with it, I follow my county's Twitter and they every day they post how many people are positive, how many were vaccinated? How many died? How many are hospitalized every day? Um, and it's always crazy because I can just see like when the numbers are going up again and then you went from having like 15 positive and then the next week you have 200 and the next week you have 700 and it's like, okay, it's going up again. Um, but yeah, I usually do get my, my news from Twitter, but I don't get it from random people I do get it from like the news outlets that are on Twitter. They're verified. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're verified. So it's okay. Um, can you share with me what you understand about COVID as an infectious disease and how you feel it's impacted society? Likewise, can you share with me what you don't understand about COVID and wish you could know more about? Okay. Um... I'll start with the first one. <laughs> COVID as a disease, what I know about it. Um, in the beginning, we didn't know a lot about COVID. And they're like, oh, it's airborne. It's whatever. I know right now in the hospitals, we treat COVID as a droplet precaution. And so droplet precautions a little, it's different than airborne. Um, you don't have to be in a negative pressure room. Um, and droplets generally, it's the, you know, stay six feet apart, keep six feet apart from them, then you should technically be fine. Um, that's how we treat it. Obviously, it's not always true. You know, things can linger, things can stay on surfaces, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But right now, I know it's like a droplet um, precaution sort of disease. I know that it's a virus. I know that it's mutated into a bunch of different strains. Um, I am triple vaxxed and I did get my vaccine. I think it was when it came out, December, 2021, I got my first vaccine. Mm. Um, I know that the vaccine is not a hundred percent. It wasn't then, it's definitely not now. Um, I know that COVID as a disease is unpredictable. Everyone gets it differently. Not everyone gets the same symptoms. Not everyone gets it for the same amount of time. And people get, they call it long COVID. Yeah, so no, yeah. some people are like sick forever. They have trouble breathing. I know that like an example would be my brother, Anthony, he lives with his dad and he, he, his dad and his stepmom all got COVID and his dad actually wound up in the ICU. And when he came home, he was on oxygen. Now my brother, he never went to the ICU. He never went to the hospital even, but he's young. He was 19 at the time, I think. And he, um, he still, can get like shortness of breath just doing things he used to before. So like it's different mm -hmm. for everyone. Um, 
what I don't understand about it, and maybe it's because I haven't looked it up, I just don't understand like where it came from. I know where it came from. I don't understand yeah, yeah, why yeah. it happened. Obviously, there had to have been some reason. Everyone has conspiracies. Some people are saying it's like contagion, like it just mutated. I was like, I mean, maybe, I don't know. And so, or I know there's people that are like, they made it on purpose and then it spread. And I'm like, if they did that on purpose, they were messing with everyone because it wrecked us all you know um i i just don't understand um and i guess the things i don't understand more just like i don't know why it happened or why it happened when it did i kind of consider myself luckier than other people because I was already in my sophomore year of college when it happened. Mm. I just can't imagine how difficult it would have been to do, to be like a senior when it happened in high school or even a senior in college and having to worry about getting a job, especially right. as a nursing major. If I had graduated into the pandemic, life would have been, I mean, we're still in the pandemic, but if I had graduated when it started, at peak, yeah, it would have been crazy. I would have been, it would have been like shooting myself in the foot for real. Like I could not, I, I could not. <laughs> Even now it still, it still gets really busy. Whenever the waves hit, like you'll have a whole ward like full of COVID patients. And then a couple of weeks later you have maybe one in the entire uh, hospital unit. So it's just, it's, it just goes back and forth like that. It's really crazy. Mm -hmm. um, I know you asked another question after that, but I don't remember what it was. <laughs> Are you you basically answered it already. Oh, okay. Uh, so do you feel your family has the same beliefs as you about COVID? Or are there some members who take it more seriously or lightly? Uh, how so? There is no one who takes it more seriously than I do. I'll tell you that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've even been told, like, by my, my stepmom has told me before. She's like, Susan, if it weren't for you, like, always in my ear, like, telling me stuff, telling me the numbers or telling me I shouldn't be doing that she's like I probably would be like going out to eat and getting drinks and stuff and I was like you don't even like to do that and she's like yeah but I would do it every once in a while she's like now I don't do it at all because you're always she's like like if you were not living here with us I, I think I would, it would be different and I'm like well good thing I'm here because I have to keep keep you online <laughs> um my dad is vaccinated and he does he wears a mask he's not an anti-masker or anything but like he'll forget he's like oh but I'm just gonna go get like I'm just gonna go pay like for gas like it's fine and I'm like just put on the mask it doesn't care if you're in there just for that little amount of time <laughs> I just I like, worry because I have younger siblings mm -hmm. um my younger sibling that lives here in this house with me he's eight right now he turns nine in June and he was just recently vaccinated like maybe a month ago because we're worried about it we didn't know about for him like whether we wanted um for like a, a little kid essentially to get the vaccine um my other siblings are also they're smaller one of them is five one of them's ten and they are preparing to get it right now but like they're always my biggest worry i don't want to get them sick I know that a lot of people are like, oh, it's okay if kids get COVID because it's okay. Like, they'll be fine. It's the older people we worry about. That's true, but I still don't want them to get it. Yeah. Unfortunately, they did. Those little two did get it, and it was really awful for them, and I wouldn't want them to have to get it again. Um, but in terms of who takes it most seriously, it's me. It is 100% me. I keep, I watch everyone like a hog. I'm always ordering new masks for the house. Um, but then my stepmom orders her own because she likes like fancy printed ones and I just buy blue because <laughs> I'm yeah. cheap. Um, um, yeah, my mom is really good about it. My mom and my stepdad are both like really serious about it. Unfortunately, they did still get sick, but 
it, it was through like a hospital visit and not through like going out to eat or going to a party like they didn't get it like that mm -hmm. um I, and I also do think that there's only so much you can do so why wouldn't I do everything I can I don't know I haven't gotten it yet you know knock on wood uh but I really hope I don't because I just don't want to be sick I don't want to have to deal with it I I'm a horrible yeah. sick person really <laughs> I hate doing anything when I'm sick but as to say that I really butted heads with people about it, it's been on the very rare occasion that I've ever had to butt heads with my family about COVID. Um, I hate to say this, it makes me sound so bad, but like, I'm always right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always right because I remember this past Christmas, our first Christmas, we didn't attend. No one had a Christmas party. We kind of like just gave presents to family, like by driving by and be like, here, here's yours. Mm -hmm. Here's mine. Thank you. Um, this past Christmas, we had a Christmas party and I was very against going. I was like, look, they're going to get sick. Someone's going to get sick. And they're like, no, everyone's like vaccinated in the house. Like, and I was like, it doesn't care. Someone can be a carrier. I wound up going and I did wear a mask at the party, except when I was eating. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. I was like, <laughs> and then I put it back on doing my best I'm doing my best with what I can <laughs> and then it turns out you know it turns out that by new year's we were getting a call like hey like sorry I have COVID my dad has COVID you know we're like oh my gosh my um my grandparents on this side they both got it and they were out of commission probably for like two months could not do anything like they were very sick and they stayed positive after those um like the first two weeks they stayed positive and then they took an, another two weeks and then they finally came out negative so that was like a month and then they were just also like after that just kind of like sick like they weren't feeling good still coughing that type of stuff um my uncle on like my stepmom's brother and his uh wife and kids uh they all got it we we're very lucky that in this household we didn't get it but I was like I told you so like it's really bad. Pretend I didn't say that. Edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> but and yeah, no, I mean, that's the only time we ever really butt heads about like wearing masks and stuff. I'm very cautious. Some would say too cautious, but it's that caution that I feel has kept my unit safer than usual. Yeah. That and honestly, God, because my dad, I don't know what he does. I know he goes golfing. He doesn't wear a mask. He he's a coach. Um, and so he he'll wear a mask. Um, but I always worry. I'm like, oh my gosh. Kim, but we all do our best. We all wear masks. We're all vaxxed. Vax, vax, vaccinated and masked. Vaxxed and masked. <laughs> yeah. Uh so speaking about vaccines, uh, this next part asks you to share any stories about uh, COVID-19 vaccines and any vaccination related stories you may wish to tell. So I know you already mentioned that you got the vaccine and you have your booster shot. Um, so what was it like uh, getting it and was it easy or difficult for you in terms of scheduling, wait time? So that's what's crazy. Um, I got one of the first batches. I got it in December of 2021. Mm -hmm. So I was literally, I remember the story. I was at the bank and I was withdrawing money. I don't know why, but I was withdrawing money. Probably just to spend things, money on things I shouldn't be spending it on. <laughs> and I got a call and I answered it. And it was from UT Health, RGV. And they're like, hey, like, we know that you're a nursing student. Would you be interested in getting the COVID vaccine? And I was like, what, really? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, I, in that moment, I had never expected that I would get it that soon. And I had never expected, I got it on the second day it was available at UTRGV. I remember that. And I never expected that I would have to just like think in that moment, like, okay, I'm going to get it. Like, I hadn't thought about it. I, so I just said, yes, I made an appointment. I, <laughs> I called my stepmom and my mom. My mom didn't answer me. She never does. <laughs> I called my stepmom too. And I was like, they just called me to get the vaccine. She's like, what? And I'm like, yeah, they called me to get the vaccine. She's like, well, what'd you say? I'm like, I said, yes. I'm like, but should I get it? She's like, I don't know. And I was like, I don't know either. Like, they, I don't know. I've never, 
she's like I would wait a little bit I was like if I wait like I'm losing my spot like I don't know when I'm gonna be able to get it Mm. and she's like well it's your decision the same thing my mom she called me back she's like well I wouldn't get it I would wait like why do you want to be the first one you don't know what it does and I was like I was like I mom that's true that's true but again I lose my spot and I just decided that since I was going to be in the hospital doing clinicals that it was better to have it than to not Mm. um should I have been more concerned probably I should have been like I have no idea what this does long term people were worried like does it cause infertility does it cause um immuno autoimmune diseases like whatever I should have been more worried I wasn't I took it I took that shot right in my arm and then I did it again (laughs) for the second round and then I did it again for the booster um, in terms of, uh, so they called me for those vaccines. They called me. So I didn't even schedule it. I was out of the blue. It just came to my phone. I was like, oh, okay. Um, for the booster, I did schedule that. I was impatiently waiting because they're letting us know, okay, we need a booster. I was already in the hospital in clinicals. Still, I'm still so many clinicals. <laughs> I was in hospital still. And I was like, okay, like I need to get it boosted. How am I going to do that? It's not available yet or whatever and then I get the email from UTRGV and it's like okay like you can register for your booster I just did it and I went it wasn't it wasn't hard it was really simple I think it was just harder for my family that wasn't like involved in the university it wasn't involved in healthcare to get the shot Mm -hmm. um so I, I got the Pfizer's and I know like a lot of, most of my family, I think all got Moderna just because it was easier for them to get a hold of. Mm-hmm. I know my grandparents, they got it through UTRGV, but to get boosted, it was like very difficult for them to like be able to get in. Um, I know like doctors here started giving it. Yeah, for them, it, it was difficult. For me personally, it wasn't hard and I kept like, I kept um, tabs on it because UTRGV also did vaccines for like people not involved in university for the community. And so mm-hmm. when I would get those emails, I would send it and I'd be like, tell your friends. I'd be like, tell your, your coworkers, this is where to get it. You gotta sign up now because it goes fast. And then it would just be like that. I, I remember doing that. <laughs> so how was, how was the process for you? Like uh, signing up, making scheduling appointments? versus uh, your grandparents or your your, your uh, family members? Like, what was the difference? So for, they obviously, they had UTRGV like student and worker priority. Mm-hmm. So it was a lot simpler for me to just like, they would have like different rounds. So like, okay, I would get an email and it would say, if you're a student of UTRGV or faculty, like you can click this link and you can make an appointment. And like, you would have to put either your employee ID or your student ID. So that was a lot simpler. And then in between those, they would save like for the community. And so like, I would send it and I was like, sign up, sign up, sign up. Um, But those obviously like they went a lot quicker because a lot of people in the community wanted it. Um, You would have those vaccination clinics that would have the long lines, like the testing. Mm -hmm. Um, That was for them that did it through through UTRGV. Uh, I had other family members that just did it through a pharmacy. I, it had been like a while though, you know, mm-hmm. to where it got to the point, the pharmacy, um, and they would get it from there. That was a lot simpler. You know, you call and you say, hey, do you have any left over? That's how we did it actually for them. Mm-hmm. Um, we didn't have appointments, but sometimes people would be no-shows and then the vaccines would go bad. So we'd like, hey, mm-hmm. like, do you have any left over today? They're like, yeah, we do. Come over like now. Okay. We would go. They would go and they would get the, the shot. Um, luckily no one in my family got the Johnson and Johnson vaccine Mm. except my stepdad's sister and her boyfriend they did get it she's she's angry now that she got it she's like I shouldn't have gotten that one she's like I got it because it was one shot I should have just gotten the other two I was like yeah I remember being offered the Johnson and Johnson vaccine actually no I'm lying it wasn't me (laughs) my boyfriend got offered it because Mm. um because like 
Well, that, that's a whole story. But he got offered to take the vaccine. He t- he asked me what I thought about it. I said, I think you should wait to just get the Moderna or Pfizer. He's like, well, why? I'm like, well, I mean, everything that's coming out right now already says that it's less effective. Like, why would you want it just because it's one shot? And he talked to his parents about it. They decided that they were going to wait. They weren't going to get the Johnson & Johnson. And then I'm glad that they waited because of all the mess surrounding that. Mm-hmm. But the process was different. It was it was a lot simpler for me to just like see the email and immediately like book versus them. They don't get these emails, you know? So they didn't see when the community opened up. I actually don't know how they would go about that in the sense of like trying to find it on the UTRGB webpage. Mm-hmm. I just know that I saw these emails and I would send them immediately to them. That's a good, that's a good point though, because I don't see how they would have been able to like be checking every day if it's open for them mm-hmm. um so this next part asked about the personal and professional aspects of your experience during the pandemic personal and uh, professional yeah okay for sure so, um well i have some questions to help you uh okay along guys so you're the oldest child of both of your parents household and i know that your family relies on your help a lot so how has your family dynamic changed since the pandemic? Hmm. The answer that pops up most in my head, there's, I'm sure there's like a ton of answers I could give you, but the answer that pops up most in my head is that I live at my, my dad's right now just because there was just more space or whatever. And my brother right now is eight and he was in first grade when the pandemic started and then second grade he did all online school and then right now he's homeschooled but during that time again both my parents um two of my parents that are here are the high school teachers so when school was online, they could be here and they could be also helping him with his schoolwork, like mm-hmm. in between classes and things like that. Um, but eventually they had to go back and the kids didn't yet. So he was here and online classes, they were online for me too, except my actual clinical days. And so I guess to get straight to the point, it's that I would watch my brother pretty much every day I didn't have clinicals. Mm-hmm. And so I would have clinicals one on a Saturday and one during a day of the week. And then every other day it was online schooling. I didn't go in person during, during most of that time. Um, So it was for most of the time. Yeah. We didn't go in person. I remember last semester we did go in person and then, so I would watch him maybe, maybe three to four days a week, depending on if class was online or not. Again, I watch him three to four days a week. And then back then I was watching him like four days a week, like for sure. Cause then I would have a clinical and then I would have my, my Saturday clinical. So I would watch him a lot um, because they would go to work and I would stay here at, at the house anyway to mm-hmm. do my classes. I was also working my job and it was online. So I would spend that time either, you know, I was always on my computer. I was making sure he was doing his work. Um, it's still the same way now. Now my job is hybrid. I had to do some days in person, some days online for the peer advisor. Um, school's the same. My class is hybrid. So I'll do some in person, some online. And then clinicals, I'll go out. So right now I watch him. It varies week to week. Sometimes I watch him four days a week because you know we're doing online everything this week. And sometimes I only get to watch him maybe two um, because of everything. Um, and that's when my my grand my grandmas on this side will like step in and they'll come in and they'll watch him. Um, but that's the biggest difference I would say in terms of like how the family dynamic changed. Just that I was watching him a lot more. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean anything. They still treat me like I'm a little kid, but <laughs> but I, that's just something different that I'm doing for the family. Um, I think that was, that's that would be the best answer for that question. And how, how has that affected you? Like how uh, your like mental health or your like physical I'm health? I'm crazy. No, no, just like don't, don't put that. Don't put that. <laughs> um, 
I can't say it's all that, like all like all that I'm watching him that that's what's like done it to me. Um, mm-hmm. I just think the pandemic in general has been really hard on my mental health, just because I'm so serious about it. So it's I get pretty anxious, but also I don't go out. I don't do anything. I don't have fun. I think like after like clinicals, a lot of nursing students like when we're done with it, they'd be like, "Oh, do you want to go like?" get something to eat or whatever and I would I would say no it's not because I didn't want to it's because I didn't want to get anyone sick I didn't want to get the kids sick I didn't want to get my grandma sick like I said Mm -hmm. I haven't eaten in a restaurant since March of 2020 I love to eat in restaurants and I haven't done it and it's just been difficult for me um hanging out with friends you know I have not been able to do that like almost at all not just because I'm busy with school, not just because I'm busy with work, not just because I'm busy watching him or whatever, but it's because it's also because just the pandemic in general makes it harder. I can't just do things the way I wanted to before. And I think that uh, that's what I said. Like, I'm lucky that I, it happened when it did. I didn't graduate into it. I didn't, you know, start college in it. But I'm also very unlucky because these are the years you're supposed to have a lot of fun, be able to do what you want for the most part, not working like a big girl job yet, just Mm -hmm. working your little job, having your little fun. And I wasn't able to do that the way I wanted to at all. Um, Pretty stifling, but I think that I think think life would be really different without COVID. Honestly, I think life would be super different, like incredibly. I don't mean just, I mean, personally, like life would be a lot different. Um, Personally, I'd be able to go places and do things. It'd be super fun. Um, But I also mean like life in general, like life, like politically, like policies and stuff. I think life would be a lot different. I think COVID has really shaped a lot of people's minds, whether it be positively or negatively in terms of like policy, uh, politics and policies and Mm -hmm. um, things like that. Things were really crazy for a time. They're still crazy now, but I think healthcare has become like a bigger topic, not big enough, but um, more in the light in terms of COVID. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's definitely affected me negatively having the pandemic. I mean, why wouldn't it? But I know some people are like, oh, I got time to myself during the lockdown and I evolved, I became a better person. I didn't do any of those things. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I was just home. I got a Switch, like a Nintendo Switch. That that did happen. That also happened. Um, I started playing Adam Crossing mm-hmm. because that was a big difference during lockdown. Is what I was. That's what I was doing. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, was there ever a time where your family took a significant hit because of COVID? Uh, related reasons. Uh, if so, at one point during this pandemic, did any worries, financial worries become an issue? And how did this impact your family's well-being? Um, financially, I don't think we were worried during the pandemic. We were really lucky. Like I said, two of my parents mm-hmm. are teachers, so they weren't at risk of losing their job. You know, they still needed teachers. Um, my mom works in healthcare. She's an RN. And she wasn't in the hospitals. She does... Um, she works like for corporate at this point in time and she also gets to work from home so like that is she has always worked from home since she got the job it's like a a, at-home job and so that was really great for her because she didn't have to go anywhere she can stay home and she wasn't again she wasn't at risk of losing her job so I think um financially we're pretty okay in the sense that no one was scared of losing their job. I also had my extra job, so it wasn't a problem like that. Um, I am really lucky about that. Uh, in terms of like a hit like to our family, 
it was when both of them got COVID, I guess. Um, on this side where I am uh, living right now, like I said, during Christmas, when they got COVID, um, when, when grandparents got COVID, it was a lot. It was pretty bad. We were worried. Um, luckily, they were never hospitalized, right? Um, we did have a, a friend of the family, and he did pass away from COVID. It was really, really sad. Uh, he was this nice guy. He was from up north, um, and he was older. He didn't really believe in it. He didn't get the vaccine. He thought that you could treat it like with medications from Mexico. I was like, okay, okay, okay. Like, and then he got it. And his girlfriend told us that he was saying how he wished that he had taken it seriously. He wished that he had gotten the vaccine and he passed away from COVID. I remember we were pretty sad. We knew he was sick, but that was pretty bad. Um, as for a hit I'm, on my mom's side of the family, when they all got COVID, the entire household got COVID. So my grandma who had cancer at the time, <clears throat> She got COVID and my mom got COVID from a hospital visit. And it was pretty, it was my great aunt started sleeping in the living room so she wouldn't get it. Um, my mom started sleeping in her home office so that she wouldn't give it to anyone else. Um, but my grandma, you know, she had cancer. She was very, very sick with COVID um, for a long time. Um, my mom tried not to give it to anyone, but then the kids got it, and then my stepdad got it. I think the only one who didn't get it was my great aunt. It was really surprising, and we're glad she didn't get it because she only has like one good lung. We did not need that lung compromised. So I don't know how she didn't get it, but she didn't get it. But everyone else did get it. Um, it was really hard. My mom was really sick. She was coughing. She was, and she was already vaccinated at this time, so we were just really like, oh my gosh. The kids, you know, they recovered pretty quick. My stepdad, he got really sick, but only for like a day or two. And he started getting better. My mom was really sick and she was still taking care of my grandma. Mm -hmm. um, it was hard for me personally because I didn't go over there. Um, just because I had to think about where I live and how I didn't want to get them sick either. It, wasn't, it, wasn't, it wouldn't be fair to them or to anyone else. Um, but yeah, you know, in terms of financial, our jobs were stable. So I, we didn't worry about that in the sense, like, I know a lot of people did lose their jobs because, you know, businesses shut down. If you're a server, like you weren't working. Right. Um, but with our jobs, we weren't, I guess the, the biggest impact was just actually them getting it and what that meant at the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know you mentioned uh, the precautions your mother took when your grandma was sick and COVID and uh, cancer too. So how did uh, COVID-19 affect the way she was cared for and how she was re received treatment? Uh, <clears throat> um, yeah. Um, I mean, she still received great care. I think the only thing that was different was like visitors allowed. So we did mm -hmm. take my grandma to MD Anderson um, for the year that she had the cancer. Um, and it would, you know, only one person was allowed per day. So one of the days my mom would go and the other day my uncle would go. Um, you know, always wearing masks. Everyone always wore, everyone who wasn't in the household. So like my mom, my stepdad, my great aunt and the kids would not wear a mask because they all lived in the house. But when I would go over, I would wear a mask. If my boyfriend went over, he'd wear a mask. My uncle, um, my grandmother's son, he would always wear a mask. My cousin would wear a mask. We would always just wear masks around her. Um, she would always wear a mask when she was in the, the doctor's office always. Um, but in terms of care, she got everything that she needed. Um, it was just like the visitor policies and then wearing masks that was different. Um, I, I would say that that was about it. In terms of like being sick, like with the COVID during that time, we we're very cautious obviously to that to take her to the hospital at any point. 
but eventually, you know, she did need to go, not because of COVID, because of just implications like of the cancer. And that's where she did get sick, unfortunately. Um, yeah, but in terms of like care, she she got everything she needed. It was just a visitor policy that I think was like really different. Mm -hmm. um, were there any changes to your family members' occupations or lifestyle because of COVID? Uh, was it a change that they enacted themselves or was it just unavoidable? Um, due to COVID, I can't think of anything that really changed. My, two of my parents are still teachers and a teacher slash coach. My mom is still working for that um, company. Um, a change within themselves. I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, changes probably obviously happened. You know, everyone's going through things like in their mind. I know it's probably frustrating for them to not be able to go like visit his sister in Wisconsin all the time. But in terms of like changes to like job, changes in like uh, mindset, I don't really think I've seen that. Mm -hmm. Everything kind of went how we expected it to. People who are always more cautious were just very cautious. People who were not as cautious are just not as cautious. Um, I don't think anyone's really made a huge, a huge change in the sense, in the name of COVID, you know, um, mm -hmm. in the name of like other things, probably like growing older, having older kids, just that happens naturally. But I wouldn't say that that was COVID's fault. And in terms of precautions, um, what type of precautions did you take during the peak of the first wave of COVID? And what are the changes of anything that you've made in your household or yourself um, during the second wave and third wave? Is it, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. So like during the first lockdown, when I was at my my boyfriend's family's mm -hmm. house, um, only the parents are allowed to go to the grocery store because they... They're like, we know where everything is best and we're the fastest. Mm -hmm. We don't want anyone like, you know, taking too much time. Okay, fair. So they were the only ones allowed to go to the store. I was like, okay. Um, they're the only ones allowed to go to the store. When they came back, we would disinfect like all the food. I remember that. We would like mm -hmm. clean the bags and stuff outside. It was, looking back, it's it's funny and it's not funny because I think about it and it's like everything really is dirty everything really is gross but I mean to take the effort to do all that I can't I can't do that um uh that was probably one of the biggest differences is like we were like wiping down groceries all the time we're mm -hmm. spending a lot of time together because we had nothing else to do like his parents are retired my boyfriend's parents are retired and we actually became retired during the pandemic that's something that happened oops I didn't say that <laughs> um they had a photography store and they were going to keep working I think another year and a half is what was left on the lease and mm -hmm. um they said look like we don't feel comfortable going back even when COVID like is gone and COVID is not gone <laughs> and so they did an arrangement and they just decided to retire so then they retired so they weren't doing anything um they were trying to find themselves, I guess, as new retired people, mm -hmm. hobbies, um, having more like time for themselves. Um, as for the sister, I think had like just graduated like prior to COVID, I believe. Don't I remember at that time she was looking for her first job as a I believe, I believe she's looking for her first job. Where they had closed off. I don't know. But she was there too. She was there too. Um, and then my boyfriend and I are students. And I hadn't started working until July of 2020. So like there was nothing to do. Like we were just there next to each other. We we're just like playing board games and watching TV series together. It sounds very fun. And it was, it was fun. But like, 
I was also getting used to like being away from things. So like not being able to go to a restaurant or not being able to just go shopping and have like just relax that way. I was mm. like literally stuck in the house. I think we would do like a walk out in the neighborhood. And I was like, okay. And it was, I don't know. I remember that those are the kind of precautions we took back then. I'm still really cautious again. Um, I always wear a mask when I go into a store. Always, always, always. I'm always carrying hand sanitizer. Get home, I sanitize. I don't sanitize everything like I did before, mm -hmm. like groceries and stuff. I don't. Um, but it's just, you know, we're cautious. We're careful. We'll always be sanitizing. That's a big thing for me, like uh, cleaning my hands. In general, though, that's what I do because I am like that. I have to do it. I remember, yesterday, I was at work. And I was working in person and then I just kept sanitizing my hands because I was in the student union and I was like, ooh, a lot of people. And she's like, why do you keep putting hand sanitizer? Because like, it's gross in here. Like, what are you <laughs> talking about? I touched the table. I feel like I touched everybody's hands that has been there like the past 400 days. Like, I don't know. That was. Um, but I don't like disinfect things anymore unless I come home from the hospital then obviously like I'll disinfect like my phone I'll disinfect like my keys um, with just an alcohol wipe just mm -hmm. because I mean it's a hospital even if it's not COVID you're bringing home something you know yeah. um, I bag my clothes that I wear at the hospital and then I'll wash them um, like a couple days later hopefully the virus has died I don't know if that's true or not they say you're supposed to wash them separately, but I, it's not my washing machine, so I can't do that. <laughs> but I do my best. I do my best, I think, and for everything. I think um, that, that would be. Yeah. So you mentioned that you started working in uh, 2020, um, right during the peak of COVID. So not spring break or May, but more towards the summer. Uh, yeah. I, I would still consider it the peak of COVID that year. So I, I want I now want to focus more on questions on your professional life, your job, the jobs that you have. So you mentioned that you work as a nurse tech. So you shadow nurses at different hospitals and schools in Edinburgh as part of your clinical training. Uh, so what does that job entail exactly? And how does your day at the hospitals look like? OK, so I only recently started working as a nurse tech. Um, so I can't like say like a ton like um, but what my job looks like, I do work in postpartum. So I work for uh, caring for mothers who just had a baby. Sometimes it's happy. Like sometimes the mother's very like excited. Sometimes it's her first baby. She's nervous. And sometimes you get like fetal demise. You have mothers who had a stillborn baby. Um, and that's very sad. You know, they're, they're not okay. You know, um, <sighs> As a nurse tech, my job is very simple. Um, I take vital signs. I help CNAs take vital signs, um, which is like blood pressure, temperature, heart rate, uh, respirations. Um, I hope I didn't forget one. I'm just, uh, I'm just like saying it right now. But if I forgot one, they're gonna get mad at me. No, okay. Um, vital signs. Um, one of the very important jobs that I do important it's important it's important to the health but like I'm like <laughs> is we always have to check urine output especially for women that have c-sections just to make sure that their their muscles down there the bladder muscles are working correctly so we mm -hmm. always check urine output um the rule is I believe you know you have to pee twice um in the six hours after you get your catheter removed um it has to be like substantial amount of urine uh, so like, that's what I do. Uh, I'll help them to go to the restroom. I teach them like, you know, here's your, call it the Perry bottle. It's like a squeeze bottle. You put hot water, warm, warm water and some soap and you can like clean it because the area is very sensitive. Um, and I measure their urine output and I say, okay, I tell the nurse, I'm like, they voided um, 300 mLs. They're like, okay, cool. I'll write that down. And then that's a large majority of my job is just doing that, um, helping with, or helping with that, um, checking catheters, like I'll empty the catheter for them and say, okay, they, between this time and this time, they avoided this much. Um, that's, that is a large portion of my job. What I'll also do is I answer call lights. So patients need something. 
I go, um, typically in postpartum, they're not very, um, they don't usually use a call light a ton just because they're usually like mostly okay. Um, they might ask for pain medication. Um, I tell the nurse, I can't give it. I have to tell the nurse like, hey, they're asking for pain medication. Like, okay. Um, usually they, they do a lot of calling, but it's like to the baby's nurse. And they're like, hey, can the baby come? Or, hey, I don't know how to do this. Or, hey, I don't know. But that's that's more them. If they need help, I'll help them with it. But I really, um, they usually call the baby's nurse for that. Um, I help with, you know, taking patients down to their cars when they leave. There's a lot of discharging done on postpartum because usually if you're a, a vaginal birth, you would only, you, you take about 24 hours depending on if everything goes like smoothly and then c-section it's 48 and so there's discharges done every day admissions every day but i mean it's very simple work like for a nurse tech there um but it can be a lot you know so i have to change sheets sometimes because um they can get dirty and things like that um the actual nurse is, is much more complicated. You have to make sure that they're voiding correctly, make sure that they their job is to assess, making sure that they're, um, you know, they're not showing signs of like postpartum depression, making sure that they are eating well, making sure that they're not bleeding out or hemorrhaging, you know, because that's a very big risk, um, just stuff like that. Uh, since uh, you started working as a nurse tech um, in late second half of the 2020 year, what differences do you notice now in April 2020 versus uh, 20, April 2022 versus um, 2020 when you were working? So per, like COVID-wise precautions, like what precautions do they have you take in the hospital? Um, back then, um, being in the hospital, when, like I would, I would like when I was in my clinicals, like for mm -hmm. school back then, uh, all students have to wear N95. So everyone in our student group was wearing an N95 mask. Um, and pretty much every like nurse and doctor on the floor wears an N95 mask back then. Um, and as time has gone on, as time has gone on, um, nowadays I still have like hospital clinicals, right? And so I'll go to the hospital with my entire student group. And again, like as students, we do have to wear the N95 and I have no problem wearing it. I would wear it anyway. <laughs> but most nurses that are on the floors, um, when I go to my clinicals, they wear just a regular surgical mask unless they're actually dealing with like a droplet or airborne precaution or COVID, they'll wear an N95 and then they switch it back to a regular surgical mask um, just because it's easier for them. And it's like, it's less scary than it was before. Um, that's the, probably the biggest difference. Interestingly, most doctors do wear an N95 the whole time, um, but they're also constantly like walking to different parts of the hospital. So I, I think that also has something to do with it. Mm. That's probably one of the biggest differences that I've seen It's just the mask. Everything else like patient care, patient care has always been the same. It has to be the same, you know? Um, but definitely the masking has been like the biggest difference. I guess another thing is like, in terms of getting into hospitals, I remember it was our first clinicals. Um, it was fundamentals of nursing and it was in, um, it was in the fall of 2020 and they were like struggling to find hospitals that would take us because no one wanted to take students in a hospital when they didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it got done. They said that we we're actually very lucky because uh, for people that were graduating that spring, you know, they could not even finish their clinicals. They had to finish in the summer because, you know, when COVID hit, like, they're like, look, we can't have you here. Like, we don't know what's going on. Like, so that was that was a big deal for them. Um, we talked about the vaccine and your relationship with it, but now I want to know how uh, the vaccine programs are vaccine talk or information is uh, spread in hospitals? Like, what is the talk there? Uh, do they have any programs? Um, does everybody so, that you talk to there support it? Like, 
I think it depends on the hospital, but I know that um, in the postpartum units, after you give birth to your baby, you know, they can see whether you took your COVID vaccine or not. And they'll say like, look, we noticed you did or you didn't take it. Do you want to get the vaccine while you're here? And they mm -hmm. give it to you. Um, at other hospitals, it's kind of the same thing. Um, if you don't have it, you're offered it. Um, I don't think it's the same at every hospital, but the ones I've been to, that's what they'll do. Um, if they ask for information, we give them the printouts on it and we explain the best we can. Um, funny though, funnily enough, I don't know if I should say this, but most people that ask for like the printouts of the information, like for certain vaccines, like 97% of the time, they don't actually get it. Um, they just have the printout and they're like, oh no, I don't need it. Oh, okay. I mean, that just explained why you needed it, but that's fine. I'm not even just talking about the COVID vaccine. I'm talking about like vaccines, like for pertussis and things like that. Mm. And when they offer them to the patient, do they set an appointment or is it something they do right then and there? So right then and there, they'll give you your first shot um, or that day they'll give you your first shot and then you'll have to come back for your second shot. Okay. Um, Along with clinicals, you also have a part-time job that you have mentioned at UTRGB as a student advisor. Um, you started working there in the middle of remote learning during the pandemic. Uh, so what did your day look like uh, when you first started working there? Mm, back then, we, 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 we make our own schedule. So we would make our own schedule. We have like a, a advisor that's kind of like our mentor. And I had the best one. <laughs> um, Basically, I would help her like create plans and stuff. So I would go over degree plans and I would see which courses a student has taken and like scratch them off and say like, look, he's already taken these, these, and these. So he needs like this many credits from here or whatever. And I, that would be like the majority of my day. Um, I would only work 19 hours a week. So I would plan that. Um, but the job has evolved since then. And now we have something called express advising which you can go on online and ask questions. And so us as peer advisors, we wait in a Zoom room for people to come in and ask us questions that we can help with. We also make appointments and we also work in person. Um, typically when we work in person, we're typically on the call center, but we can do that remote too, if we wish. Mm -hmm. um, and just answer questions from people that call the advising center. Uh, so was Express Advising something that was uh, made because of COVID? I think express advising has always been um, a thought because a lot of times people will make an advising appointment for something that takes like five minutes mm -hmm. or like a Google search that they just didn't um, see at the time. And it can be kind of like a hindrance to other students that actually have like a true problem only an advisor could solve. But I think that COVID really pushed that um, really push the creation of it finally just because we had something that everyone would know how to use zoom mm -hmm. and we had like the opportunity to like make that something for everyone not just like come into the we also have express advising in person that they can come ask us and we can just either make the appointment or give them the answer but I think having it on zoom is so much more convenient because students can just stay at home and like ask the question and then take leave the zoom room versus having to drive to campus go there and then be like well I might as well see an advisor anyway like I'm already here which you know I would think so too mm -hmm. but yeah it wasn't created because of COVID but the COVID technology we got, like using Zoom all the time, really did help with that. Um, did you have to work or was it your choice? It was my choice. Mm. I like to buy things. <laughs> and I like to shop. Was the work being remote appealing to you initially or would you have taken a job elsewhere if it were not remote at the time? Absolutely not. I wanted a remote only job. <laughs> I didn't want to have to leave. It was just yeah. more convenient. And with COVID, I didn't want to have to be unnecessarily exposing myself. I know that was an issue when I told my mom I was looking for a job. And I was like, no, I just want something remote. Um, most jobs that are remote are not as good as I feel. Or you need more like tech skills than you would for my peer advising job. I'm very lucky that I have the job that I do. And I love my job. I do. <laughs> And um, during the initial days of remote learning, what did you find yourself helping students with the most? So 
students had trouble. Um, honestly, students still have trouble uh, registering for classes and making advising appointments. Um, they did change at some point. They changed the way that you make the appointment on your your Navigate, and so they would have questions. And so we would just help them with that via call center or uh, that. Or people will have questions like, "Why is it saying I don't have this prerequisite? I have this prerequisite." And I'm like, "Well, let me see. Um, share your screen with me, and let me see what's going on." Um, but it was mostly just that. Mm. And what were the challenges in working from home? Having a quiet area is definitely one of the biggest challenges. My room doesn't have the best Wi-Fi. So if I go into like the more central part of the house, um, it's going to be louder. Mm -hmm. Right now, the room that I was using as my sort of like it's the extra room in the house, um, the office sort of. Uh, my stepmom used it as her office when she was working from home. And then I started using it as kind of like mine. Uh, but then we got two birds. And so they, they're very loud. It's like doo -doo 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 -doo, all the time. So I'm like, oh my goodness. I've literally been on calls before. The only way they'll be quiet is if you let them out of the cage. And I've been on calls before where like the bird just like flies on my head and I'm just sitting there and I'm like still talking. <laughs> and then the person in front of me is just like, <laughs> I'm like, yes, it's a bird. <laughs> it's real. <laughs> and why did you guys decide to get the bird? My brother wanted them. And they asked me, Susan, like, what do you think about getting birds? And I said, well, I like birds. I was like, they're fairly simple to take care of. It's not like, it's fine. Like you want a bird, like I support it. I don't mind getting a bird. When did you guys get the bird? We got them June of last year for my brother's birthday. Um, it was actually kind of hard to find them, but then we found them this lady who had like a bunch of them and so we're like okay let's i'll take them um one of them is very nice well i guess he's not that nice but like he likes to like be on people's shoulders be on people's heads um loves to fly the other one is very shy and timid we don't we don't mess with her she gets mad and she starts like flying around we're like ah! <laughs> um but yeah, they always tell me that it's my fault that we got, they got the birds. I'm like, I didn't, you asked for them. I just said it was okay. She's like, Susan, they live 15 years. I can't do this for 15 <laughs> more years. I'm like, well, you're going to have to. She's like, uh, but I mean, it's funny. I like them. And, and do they liven up the atmosphere? Definitely. My, my dad even gets mad. Like if he hears them chirping, like sometimes we'll close the door. But they have the room like to fly around. It's like bird proof. Okay. So they can do it. I'm not, they're not in danger. <laughs> um, and they'll be like chirping because they want to get out. And my dad's like, why? It, okay. The bird's name is Nugget, one of them. And the other one is Pearl. And my dad will be like, why is Nugget chirping? And then he like opens his voice, like, come here, Nugget. And then Nugget goes with him and is just like on his shoulder. But Nugget likes him best because my dad will feed him like food. I'm like, e tortilla. I don't know. <laughs> um, for your advising job you mentioned that you started working hybrid now so what precautions did they put in place for the employees um, masking is not required but is recommended so of course I would mask anyway um, I mask anyway um, but yes we do recommend masks for all employees and we recommend masks for all students coming in however they are not required that's pretty much the only precaution we have in place we do still have online virtual meetings um, I think they're just better the only problem is you know sometimes people don't have great internet connection and then the meeting is like kind of goes bust or they don't know how to use zoom so you spend a significant amount of time trying to teach them but i think once that learning curve is gone i think that's much simpler um especially for students that say we cannot have like if i don't go to campus on tuesdays but the only available appointments on a tuesday then i would have to like have someone come watch my brother drive to campus i live kind of far and then drive back when i could just hop on a zoom meeting and be watching my brother in the other room, discuss my concerns and not have to waste gas or time, you know? So I just feel like it's it's much more convenient. Um, so now that the fall semester of 2021 brought back um, hybrid learning or in-person learning even as an option at UTRGV, what um, new problems did you help students with 
um, as many made the transition back to in-person learning and the physical classroom on campus. So actually most students um, that if you ask them, they do wanna do in-person learning, especially for more difficult classes. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the difficulty was in just getting them to understand different terms. So like hybrid, reduced, hybrid and reduced seating are both different. Um, mm -hmm. Reduced seating um, is like a specific percentage of in-person and specific percentage online. Uh, hybrid, again, it's a different percentage of in-person, different percentage of online classes. Um, the traditional face-to-face -face and then like online asynchronous versus online synchronous is all very different. I think one of the biggest struggles with transitioning back is having students understand what the different um, types of classes are. But aside from that, I think most students want to go back in person anyway. So I don't, mm. it wasn't much of an issue for students that did want only online classes. I know a lot of students like literally moved away. Like I live in Houston now, like I need to take online classes. I'm like, we literally don't offer this class online. I don't know what to tell you. I'm so sorry. Let's talk to an advisor for another class you could take or whatever. That's so, so they lived in Houston. Yeah, I'm like, why would you do that? You're a semester <laughs> away, come on. <laughs> but. So, um, I want to focus on school now, but on your schooling, your personal schooling. So I'm going to ask questions um, pertaining to your experience with school and the pandemic, um, the peak of it and where it's at right now. So remote learning began in spring 2020 up until fall of 2021. Mm -hmm. So how did your classes change when we went online uh, since you were in the nursing program? All clinicals still had to be in person, so that didn't change. I like regardless of whether classes were online, clinicals did have to be in person, um, so that never changed. Um, I think my first and second semester we did do classes online. Um, it was a little, just a little bit harder. Had to get used to it. Uh, learning like really important information online. Um, can be kind of difficult, but I do like online classes for the most part. It just depends on how the teacher runs them. Like if someone is like doing problems or whatever on the actual like screen, then I think that's a great learning um, experience versus someone who is just like looking at you and talking. Um, where you, I think that Zoom classes that are online can be great just I think student participation is also a big factor. I know a lot of people say, well, I can't ask questions online. Yes, you can. Um, and so that's something that you should do in terms of like going to campus and not, um, I honestly prefer online classes just because I live further away. I don't like to drive. I don't like to look for parking. That's a whole thing. Um, but you know, I don't mind it either way for the most part. Like in terms of like actual content and actual learning, I don't have a preference for my nursing classes from one or the other. Um, yeah, I really don't. Um, so how is your school's response towards the pandemic and the period of remote learning? Did your school make learning accessible? Like how did you see UTRGV? respond to the pandemic and did you think they responded in a responsible manner? I think UTRGV did respond in a responsible manner. They sent everyone online. Um, and then for the next year, we did mostly online classes with some classes transitioned to in-person if they wanted. Only recently in the past, the fall 2021 to now spring 2022, did they say that, you know, school classes are going back online guys. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, going back in person. Um, and so I, they still do offer some classes online, some don't, mm -hmm. um, but I think they were responsible. They gave a ton of COVID incentive money to students to like stay in school. Um, I think that was a huge help and it's mm -hmm. a lot of money. Um, they also like were providing vaccinations to students and faculty as well as to the community. So I think UTRGB really did have a good response to the pandemic. Um, not everyone would agree, but personally, I think that they did a lot for their students. I think that they did handle it in the best way that they possibly could. So do you um, take any hybrid classes or in-person classes um, recently? 
Um, I do, but it's not like an, an a online class. It's one of those classes that has always been online mm-hmm. um, and they're asynchronous online classes. So like um, my nursing research class, we don't get lectures. We just do the work. Um, same for my leadership class, um, no lectures, it's just online. Um, but those have always like in the past before COVID been like that too. So it's not a big deal. Um, and I've taken those types of classes before, so it's not a huge problem. Uh, so what about uh, campus as a whole? Um, when you go on campus on the days that you have to go, do you feel safe going back to campus um, with the precautions that were put in place? I mean, I wouldn't say there's a ton of precautions now. Obviously, they recommend that everyone wear a mask. Does everyone mm-hmm. wear a mask? No. Um, and as more time goes on, I see less and less people wearing a mask daily. I do see all nursing students in our lectures wear a mask. I check because I'm real like, I'm like that. Okay, I'm like that. I have to check. We all do wear masks. Um, but in terms of like going to campus, um, me working on campus, students that I see, not everyone wears a mask. And in fact, I think it's right now it's about 50-50, possibly less that wear a mask, um, which is a huge difference because you were seeing upwards of 95% of people wearing a mask back in the day. Back in the day. Back in the day. Okay, so uh, this last section asks you to share any stories uh, you have about this pandemic and the response by local, state, and national elected officials and Mm -hmm. gather your final thoughts. Um, So feel free to respond or pass on any of these questions. Uh, Do you feel satisfied with the local response to COVID um, within the Hidalgo County area in these last two years? Not really. I th- it mostly has to do with schools. Um, I feel like they didn't do enough to protect the students. Um, I know they're doing the best that they can with what they can, but I do think that online school should have been offered for everyone by the district, mm-hmm. not just I know right now they have a program where like if you get COVID and you say you can do online school for two weeks via the district. I think that they should have offered that the whole time. Um, It might not be, and I don't know the specifics of what goes into it, but I still think that it should be offered. I think it's a good idea and I don't know why it's like so against it. Um, Are you satisfied with the state response to COVID led by uh, Governor Abbott over these last couple of years? No, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> I don't agree with him on a lot of things, on most things, on anything he really says, really. Um, we don't agree. Um, I think that he doesn't take the pandemic as seriously as he should have. I think a lot of people lost their lives for no reason. Um, and I think that if things have been a little bit stricter or if things have been taken more seriously, that people's lives would have been saved. Um, And I think that's a huge thing. Do you have any specific um, uh, thing about his policies or uh, his thought process on the pandemic that you really resonated with you, that you did not agree with? I know like the masks were a huge thing. Like he's like, no, Mm -hmm. no one wears masks. Uh, <laughs> the thing is, everyone has a choice. I believe it, but when that choice affects others, then it has to be, you know, regulated. Like mm-hmm. we all know that masks work better to protect others around you. So if I'm in a room wearing a mask and no one else is, I'm making barely a difference to myself, but I'm protecting everyone around me a lot. If I had COVID and I didn't have a mask on, people would be like, oh my God, why don't you have a mask on? But like, it's okay for them. Not for me though, you know? So it's like, it's just uncomfortable, especially for people that work like in retail and things like that. Like for them to be wearing a mask and to have people just come up to them and not wearing a mask, not being respectful about it. It just shows that they don't care and Abbott showed that he didn't care, so. Um, How do you feel about the national response to COVID-19 led by President Trump in the year 2020 and then President Biden from 2021 to present? I don't think it was a great response. I think the lockdowns could have been done a lot better. 
um i think that the money that was promised like the stimulus checks could have given more i think they did their best but it wasn't good enough and mm -hmm. i say that wholeheartedly i think they thought they were doing the most they could they weren't but they thought they were um I don't agree with it I think that things could have been done a lot better the only thing I can say is that it's the first time this has happened in our lifetime so I can give them the benefit of the doubt with that but to purposely not listen to scientists and virologists and all of people who actually know what's going on I can't really forgive that because why would I trust a politician over a scientist when I'm learning about a virus? Like, y'all did not go to the school for the same thing. So <laughs> um, that's like asking me to like put my life in the hands of a baker. Like, what is he gonna do? Like, is the baker gonna do surgery on me? No, the doctor is. So I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm being unfair. Maybe the baker knows surgery, but. <laughs> I don't know. So if you had the power of political office to respond to COVID, what would you do differently? I mean, people won't like this, but I would have been stricter. I would have been like, masks everywhere. Mask up. I would have given money to the community. I really would have um, put money into the community, especially for people who had like lost their jobs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um and i would have done stricter lockdowns right at the beginning to try and like flatten the curve as they say um but again you know i think it's just hard i think people are very stubborn and people are hard-headed and people want to do what they want to do it's hard to convince people that what's best for them is something they don't really understand a lot of people won't accept they can't understand and a lot of people don't understand a lot <laughs> not to be like mean but a lot of people don't understand what a virus is or how it works or how to stop it and so they're like no i won't do that do it i do it but i think we as a society just have to be um kinder and more involved with each other versus very individualistic i don't want to do it so i'm not going to do it is not correct say oh i don't want to do it but person next to me is you know, is immunocompromised. So let me do it for them. But I just don't really see a lot of that here. I would like to think I see more of it, but I don't. Mm. I think that's the problem. People. And this is a special year in our national democracy because it's a midterm election voting year. Do you mm -hmm. plan to vote? And if so, is the issue of COVID-19 going to factor into your vote? Yes, it is, yes. 100%. So will you consider um, the national response to COVID pandemic in your vote for uh, any type of can candidate? Yes, but because when, it, when you say COVID, I also mean health-wise. I mm -hmm. think healthcare is really important. I think it's not taken seriously in this country. So healthcare is a huge factor in who I vote for at all times. Mm -hmm. Um, is there any sort of help or aid you could have used at the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic to make your life more manageable, less stressful, or is there any assistance you wish you would have had at this point in the pandemic? I think I was very lucky. I think I was very lucky in terms of like job security and family and everything like that. I don't think that I needed any more support. It's always nice. Like, let me pay my for my, my books and let me pay for my car, let me pay for my gas. But in terms of like needing it, I don't think I ever needed it. Um, and I'm very lucky to be able to say that. Uh, what impact or purpose do you hope your story may have on listeners of the Voices of the Pandemic Digital Archive? I don't know. <laughs> I hope that maybe someday someone can watch this and think like, wow, I don't know. I should eat like cabbage and rice and I can lose weight. <laughs> I don't know what someone could get from my story. It's just maybe they can see that you need to be careful and you need to take others into account. And even if it's doing something you don't want to do, 
sometimes it's for the best. So I want to go out, but I don't do it. And look at me, knock on wood. Uh, <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> Um, I think I think that's what I would want them to get from it is that you have to think about the greater good. You have to think about the people around you. Um, and it's okay to be selfish sometimes, but not when you're playing with people's lives. Can't do that. <laughs> um, and just that, just that, you know, you have to be careful and you have to like look around you and think about what's best for yourself, what's best for others. And just keep in mind that sometimes your situation is not as bad as the person next to you and that you're lucky. I had to think about that a lot. I had to be like, you know what? I'm pretty lucky because my car works so I can get to work or my car works so I can go to the store and be there early, you know, or just stuff like that. Or I have a Costco card. I don't. My dad does. But my dad has a Costco card. So we had a lot of stuff already at the beginning of the pandemic when things are running out, like just things like that. Um, is there anything else you would like to add um, with and share with me about your experiences with COVID that I have not asked about? I don't think so. I, I think the only thing I wanna say is like how terrible COVID can be. Like when I couldn't see my family that had COVID for a long while to protect my other side of my family. Um, that was really painful for me and I don't regret it, but I don't look back fondly on it either. Um, just, you know, everything, should, every people, everyone needs to be careful, especially around people who are sick, you know? But um, I would say that's it. So that is the end of our interview. Mm -hmm. um, I really enjoyed talking to you today about your COVID uh, 19 experience and stories and I thank you for taking the time out of the day to speak to me um it was very insightful and um and thank you thank you <laughs> I had a good time thank you for listening to my stories it was nice thank you